Hello. Thank you, Ed. Um, when, when I was invited to do this, which was about a year and a half ago, I thought quite hard about what to do. And I think I might have sort of misjudged this by talking a lot about the neural basis. So I'd like to kind of get a sense of what your background is. How many of you are, are studying linguistics? So really doing linguistics. And how many of you are studying something else? OK, that's quite a few. And um, is this, I don't suppose any of you have studied biology except in high school, is that correct? There's no biologists here. OK, what about neuroscience? Computer science? OK, what well, computer science? I've got something for you. Um, any other, what, other, what about the other people who aren't doing linguistics? Are you guys doing literature or? Yeah. OK, so this. I'll try and keep this at a level. So I'm going to introduce you to a bunch of biology and a bunch of neuroscience, and I want to do it in a way that stays within, um, that, well, I want to keep it interesting. And I'll, so I'll try not to throw too much jargon. But if I do throw a bit of jargon that you don't recognize, please stop me. This will be mainly towards the end when I start talking about the, the brain. But I think the beginning will, will be very interesting. So I've been studying language evolution for a long time. Basically, I did my PhD on this back in 1994. Um, and ever since, I've been sort of fighting the same fight. And I like to think of this in terms of this uh, parable of the elephant, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. There are different versions, but uh, one of them is a blind man with an elephant. And each blind man feels a different part of the elephant, and one says, holds the, tr the, the um, leg and says, ah, the elephant is like a tree. Another holds the trunk and says, the elephant is like a snake. The other holds the tail and says, the elephant's just like a horse, etc., etc. And the point is that each one of them is convinced they know what the elephant is without seeing the whole elephant. And I think very often in the field of language evolution, we make the same kind of mistake. So here are three great scholars, probably all of them somewhat familiar to you. Um, each one of whom has a different notion of what the key aspect of language, what makes language language. And for Noam Chomsky, probably the most familiar, he's in the last 20 years or so, he's been saying basically language is merge. Merge is this operation that puts things together and that's what makes language language. My old uh, thesis supervisor, Philip Lieberman, was convinced that speech is the key to language because once you get the neural mechanisms for speech, syntax comes for free. Um, Michael Tomasello, how many of you know Mike Tomasello? Is he familiar to raise your hand if you've, not, not that many, okay. I guess you guys have all heard of Chomsky there, right? Chomsky, Merge, yeah. So Michael Tomasello is trained as a psychologist and he's worked a lot with apes and his idea is that what makes language, key, the key thing behind human language is what he calls shared intentionality, our ability for two or more individuals to basically form a common notion of something. And that's basically, that's the fundamental of semantics and the fundamentals of pragmatics. And each one of them has basically built a career focusing on one or the other of these things. And I guess I would like to say that in a sense they're all wrong because I don't think language is any one thing. But in a sense they're all right in the sense that they're um, putting their finger on something that's really important. So the approach that my colleagues and I have been using to study the biology of language uh, for the last, like I said, 20 years or so is what, what I call the multi-component view. And the idea is that language, it's a very simple idea. We want to break down language into its multiple components. And those include things like speech perception, that's fundamental for speech, or hierarchical syntax that's fundamental for, for uh, Chomsky and Merge, et cetera, et cetera. The drive to communicate theory of mind that underlies this shared intentionality of Tomasello. And also other things that you might not even think of, like vocal imitation or capacity to hear a sound and then repeat it. And what I would like to suggest is that all of these different mechanisms make up language, and they all play a role. And it doesn't really make one, much sense to say that one of these is the key to language, at least if you want to take an evolutionary point of view. Because what I'm really interested in is understanding how these different mechanisms work in the brain and where they came from biologically. Where, where, what are the evolutionary roots of these? And so to basically pull my entire 400-page book into a single slide, 
What I would argue is that most of these components of language are shared with other species. To some extent, other animals can do these things. So what I've done here is drawn all of the things that we know are, part, are used in language but are shared with other animals. I'm not going to read through them all, but you can see that it's quite a lot. But of course, other animals don't have language. And what I mean by language is simply the capacity to communicate anything they can think. So we know that most animals have lots of, they know a lot, but they have no way of communicating that with their species typical uh, communication languages, uh, communication systems. Um, so what gives us language is all of this stuff that we share with other species, and then a few things that are unusual. And I've called these three things the, uh, the three S's, signal, syntax, and <coughs> semantics, because these are three things that if we take a close look at what chimpanzees can and can't do, these are things that seem to differentiate us from chimpanzees, which are our nearest living cousins. So what that means from an evolutionary point of view, are these are things that had to evolve in the last six million years since we evolved from our common ancestor with chimpanzees. So from the point of view of the evolution of language, we can take this stuff for granted. This is stuff that we had long before we evolved language. And then we had to evolve a few new things. And together, all of this stuff gives us this capacity to communicate anything we can think. So that's what I want to convince you of today. Now, I'm a biologist, and from a biological point of view, there's two different ways to do comparisons uh, between animals and humans, or I should really say non-human animals, since we're animals as well. Um, and we basically, we go through, uh, through different species and we ask, what's common? What, what is shared and what is different? And there are two different ways in which things can be shared, or two different reasons that things can be shared. One is biologists call it homology. And homologies are things that a number of related species, like us and our nearest relatives, chimpanzees and gorillas, share because we inherited those from a common ancestor. So if we go, went back about 10 million years, there was one species here that was neither a chimpanzee, nor a human, nor a gorilla. It was the common ancestor of all three. It was our great, 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 great grandmother that we shared with the chimpanzee and the gorilla. That was about 10 million years ago. And anything that we all share today that was inherited from that, like being relatively large, having big brains, having long childhoods, um, being pretty good with our hands, all of these things are things that are shared by all the great apes. And they're shared because of the fact that they were present in this common ancestor. Okay? So that's one kind of similarity, and maybe it's the easiest one to get your head around. But there is another way in which different species can share similar traits. And for example, uh, humans walk on two feet, and so do birds. Right? So we're bipedal, just like birds. That's not because our common ancestor with birds walked on two feet, because our common ancestor with birds was basically a reptile living about 150 million years ago, walking on all fours. So what this means is that birds and humans independently started walking on two feet. And whenever we see similarities like that, that's called convergent evolution, sometimes called analogy. Okay? Why are these important? You might say, well, that's, that's irrelevant. If they evolved it separately from us, it's irrelevant. But the reason that these convergently evolved traits are important is that they allow us to try and ask about what are the reasons that a particular trait would evolve. So if I want to know why does bipedalism evolve, I want to look at all of the different groups that have evolved to walk around on two legs. Okay? So I'm going to give you some examples of both of these things, homology and convergence, as we go along. But basically, we want to keep, keep these straight. We don't want to confuse them. They're very, very different. But they're both useful when we try and think about evolution. OK, so back to what makes, what gives us language and not chimpanzees. So as I said, I call these the three S's for signal, syntax, and semantics. Signaling, as I'm going to show you, is basically the capacity to control our vocal tract to make all of the sounds that we use in, in Dutch or English or Chinese or whatever. Syntax is really what, what uh, many people see as one of the hearts of language. It's the capacity to build up complex hierarchical structure. But of course, semantics, the um, use of these structures to convey meanings, is what most normal people would say, yeah, well, that's what language is about. It's about communication. It's about sharing our ideas. And I don't, again, I don't want to say that any one of these three things is, is crucial. But what we do know is that all three of these differentiate us from chimpanzees. 
All of us, all three of these things make us different from our nearest and okay? So ultimately, once we can understand how these three things evolved, we're going to know a lot more about how our species got language, how and why our species got language. Okay, make sense so far? So what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk, I, I don't have time to talk about all three, so I'm going to talk just about signaling and syntax to give you a taste of how we can use this comparative approach looking for homology and analogy to try and understand um, how we got these, these three essays. Okay, so I'll start by talking about speech. And I'm going to try and convince you that it's about our brains and not about our vocal tracts. Um, then try and get closer to what is it that's special about syntax, because I, I will show you that other animals have some basic syntax. They just don't have the same kind of complexity of syntax that we do. And then I'll end by talking some about the neural mechanisms, but I, I think I might not get too heavily into that. All right, so probably all of you have noticed that there are no talking chimpanzees out there. And maybe we'll see, you know, if you've watched Planet of the Apes, you've seen what look like uh, talking chimpanzees. But in the real world, there is not a single non-human primate that can imitate even very basic words or phrases. Okay? This is just one example. This is a little chimpanzee who was raised from, from infancy in a human home and learned to do all kinds of things. She could tie her shoes, she could wash the dishes, she could drive a car, she played games with the local kids. So basically, if you raise a chimpanzee in a human home, they can learn to do all the stuff, but what she did not learn was how to speak. And even with intensive training, so her adopted parents would move her mouth and feed her grapes every time she did something close to a word, even with this intensive training, after several years, all she could do were, was basically go, and that was supposed to be cup, it was supposed to be mama. So really, really, not even, not even words, not even intelligible words. Okay? So what's going on? And what, what those names over there are all the different people who have raised chimpanzees or gorillas or orangutans in a human home. And not one of those animals has ever picked up human language, even the most basic stuff. So what's going on with this? Why is that? Why can our nearest relatives not produce any of the sounds that we, you, we use in speech. The old, well, there's, there's two basic hypotheses, and these go back to Darwin. Darwin had already thought about this in 1859. Um, one of the possibilities is it has something to do with the anatomy of the vocal tracts, and in particular, this slide shows a, a, a well-known difference between us and other apes, that our larynx is low in our throat. So early in development, our larynx pulls down in our throat, and that makes us quite different from most other animals. For example, a chimpanzee who has a high larynx, the larynx is quite close to the nasal passage, so he can actually stick his larynx up into his nose and breathe through his nose. And more importantly, the tongue is just flat in the mouth. So the, the tongue has this flat shape, whereas our tongue, it's as if, as if we've half swallowed our tongue. So our tongue has a back and forth part, a, a, a backward facing part and an upward facing part. It's not typical in those animals. Okay, so that's a possible difference between us and chimpanzees that might explain why we can speak. And that idea goes back to Aristotle, that there's something about the anatomy that keeps other animals from talking. Um, Darwin considered it, but he thought it was more likely that it had something to do with the brain. So these are two different hypotheses. They both make a certain amount of sense. And the question is, how can we test these? So I've been interested in this question since I started my PhD because, my, as I said, my thesis supervisor was convinced that speech is really crucial. And he did an experiment back in 1969, I guess before most of you were born, um, where they took a dead monkey and they tried to rebuild the vocal tract of this monkey in a computer model and figure out what the monkeys, what sounds the monkey could make. And what they claimed, what they found was, if this is a, a F1 formant, first formant, second formant plot of, of, um, of, vowel, of vowels, E, A, uh, and U, these are the three human point vowels that we find in virtually all human languages. What these points here represent is what this computer model of Lieberman's monkey could produce. So what you can see is, basically, they're all just variants of the vowel A. Uh, so the claim was, based on this dead monkey, like the cast of a dead monkey, that monkeys can only say, uh, and they wouldn't be able to produce the different sounds that you would need to, to produce human languages. 
So what, what uh, Lieberman and his colleagues concluded is the acoustic valve spaces of a rhesus monkey is restricted. These animals lack the output mechanism necessary for the production of human speech. Okay? Now how many of you are familiar with that idea? That the reason monkeys can't talk is because their vocal tract is not built right. Is that, is that a familiar idea? That's all? I'm surprised. One of the reasons I decided to do what I'm going to show you now is because I saw in The Simpsons, Homer Simpson got a monkey, and the argument was that the reason the monkey couldn't talk was because of its vocal tract. And, and I realized, wow, this is a really ingrained part of our culture now. If, if everybody thinks, if even The Simpsons is saying this is why. As I said, Darwin thought that it was the brain. I've always thought it was more likely that it was the brain. And one of the reasons that I thought, oh, so, so this is, the, the, the red is the human and the blue is the monkey. One of the reasons that I thought this is that early on in my career, I started doing x-rays of animals while they vocalized. I'm going to show you now an x-ray of a dog barking. So this is the dog's jaw here. This is the larynx. And what you're going to see is that when the dog barks, the larynx pulls down on the throat. So this descended <coughs> larynx that we have, basically the dog takes on the same configuration as us during its barks. Okay, so this is the larynx. This is the color, the base of the neck. You can see the tongue was being pulled down with it while the dog barked. So I, saw, I, I published this paper back in 2000 and as soon as I saw this, and we've seen this in every ant mammal that we've looked at, that the, the larynx pulls down and that the, the vocal tract rearranges itself during vocalization, it just seemed to me pretty obvious that, well, if the dog wanted to, he could pull his throat down, he could wiggle his tongue around and make whatever sounds he wanted to. Okay? So we were the, some of the first people to ever do these kinds of x-rays, but once I saw this in 2000, I thought, all right, this, this, this can't be, it can't be about the anatomy of the vocal tract. But as I said, this idea that it's the, the vocal tract is the crucial thing kept going. And so quite recently, my colleagues and I, uh, this is Asif Gazanfar and Bart DeBoer, decided to do what Lieberman had did, but now do it right, using x-rays of living monkeys. So instead of basing our model, our computer model, on the cast of a dead monkey, we actually got a living monkey that we did x-rays. <coughs> And this is just one of the 100 x-rays that we use. This is Emiliano, or it's a uh, macaque. And you can see that he's making a little grunt vocalization that he does when he wants food. And you can see that there's this movement of the larynx, just like what I showed you in the dog. Rapid movement of the larynx every time he makes one of these grunts. Here it is again. See that going down right there? Okay, so what we did is we took a hundred such videos, so we had different videos of him chewing and swallowing and yawning and making different uh, macaque uh, communication gestures, vocalizing in different ways, and we made tracings of each of these um, vocal tract configurations, so we basically just traced out the vocal tract, and we used those tracings to build a computer model. So now we're making a computer model that's based on what we actually see the monkey doing in its, in its real life. So we start with these tracings. Once you have those tracings, you can calculate the formant frequencies that would result from all of these different vocal tract shapes. And we can use that to build a computer model of what kinds, what a monkey would sound like if it talked. And what we found, here's that plot that I showed you before. So these are the uh, human females vowels, E, uh, uh, you know, e, ooh, ah, no, e, ooh, ah. And this is the Lieberman monkey, this, this old paper from 1969. And here's what we found our monkey could do. So these, this basically covers all of these hundred points that we saw the monkey doing. And now we can take the most extreme vowels of this plot and ask how discriminable they are. And they basically sound like i, e, a, a. So they're quite discriminable. And we did experiments to show that. So a human being can discriminate five vowels from this monkey's, this uh, computer monkey, perfectly well. Okay? That's kind of boring. So we also did this, and it kind of went viral and went all over YouTube a couple of years ago. So maybe some of you have even heard this. What we decided to do was let's see what, let's make our computer model talk. Um, we started with just, I happen to have this recording of my wife. Will you marry me? So that's not how, what my wife normally sounds like. That's my wife's 
formants resynthesized with a, a monkey uh, source. So that's why it sounds kind of weirdly whispered. But Will you marry me? You can understand what it's saying, right? Now, what we do now is let our monkey vocal tract come as close as possible. It, it basically is trying to approximate the same formant frequencies. So listen carefully now. This is what the monkey would do. Same source. Anybody get that? Okay, so it's a little indistinct. It doesn't sound the same. It sounds sort of smaller, as you might imagine. But it's still quite clear. It's still quite distinct. And there can be no doubt that uh, with, with these attested vocal tract shapes, a monkey could produce plenty of different sounds, plenty of different vowels and consonants, and make the sounds enough to communicate linguistically. So it's not the vocal tract that's keeping monkeys from doing this. Um, monkey, I mean, we've done this with monkeys, but I think the same would really be true for a chimpanzee or for a dog or a cat. I don't really think this is a special thing. So if it's not the anatomy, it must be something about our brain. Our, our neural control over this apparatus, our capacity to play this instrument is what's important, <coughs> not the instrument itself. So you might ask, well, the brain's a big place. What, what, what is it? Are there, do we have any clues about what's special about the human brain that gives us this capacity to, to imitate sounds and to produce this wide range of sounds? And I think there's at least two things. One is that we need to have connections between the auditory parts of our brain, auditory cortex that hear and process sounds, and the motor cortex that controls this vocal anatomy. So these connections need to be there so that you can hear something, remember it, and then produce that later. Um, but it turns out those connections seem to be present in chimpanzees and in monkeys. So this doesn't seem like something that's unique to us. Right? So these audiomotor connections are necessary, but probably not going to explain what we really want to explain. What does seem to be a crucial difference is that in most mammals, the connections between the motor system, the motor cortex, and the neurons that control the larynx and the tongue and the lips, the vocal tract, are only indirect. So they have to go through the, these intermediate neurons, these inner neurons. And these guys are the ones that are really in control. Okay? And our, the, the cortex in a normal mammal only has indirect access. In humans, we still have those, and these, are, these connections are still involved in things like repressing laughter. Like if you want to not cry or not laugh, we can, we can do that via these inner neurons. But we've evolved a separate set of direct connections from our motor cortex, from the laryngeal area, down onto the neurons that control our larynx and our tongue and our lips. Right? So that seems to be a difference. That's something that's different between us and chimpanzees that plausibly explains why we have this additional control over, over our, our, our vocal tract. Okay, now that's, that's a difference between us and other primates, but that's really, essentially it's one statistical data point. We've got it, other primates don't. And you might ask, can we ever test that hypothesis? How could we test that hypothesis? And that's where convergent evolution becomes our friend, the second kind of similarity. Um, and as I'm sure you're all aware, there are plenty of animals that, even though chimpanzees can't produce uh, speech sounds, there are plenty of animals that can. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples here. This is an Italian-speaking mina bird that I ran into in a bar in Ticino. And, you, know, you walk in and this, this mina starts speaking Italian to you. So you're going to hear me in the background trying to induce him to make these sounds. He does a bunch of mina stuff initially. He, he seems to be daring me to make mina sounds. But finally, you'll hear his Italian. Okay. Are there any Italian speakers here? Oh, wow, okay. So all my Italian colleagues say his accent is much better than mine. What a sad He sounds like a real mafioso or something. So, I mean, think how amazing that is. Our nearest living relatives, even with intensive training, can't even learn to say mother. And basically stick a bird in the corner of a bar and he's, he, can, he picks up all these Italian phrases. Okay? So that's, that's really quite impressive, uh, but I'm sure that's familiar. You all know that there are talking birds. Here's one you might not know about. There, this is a talking seal. This is a, a harbor, harbor seal. He was named Hoover. 
Um, his mother died basically in childbirth, and he was taken in by a fisherman and raised in this fisherman's home in Maine, in uh, the Northeast United States. And after he got to, he was called Hoover because he ate so much, and after a while he just got too big, and they donated him to the New England Aquarium in Boston, Massachusetts, where once he started becoming sexually mature, so several years after he said bye-bye to the, to the fisherman, he started making the sounds that I'm going to play. And the first people who heard this really thought they were going crazy. So this is a seal. <laughs> It's probably not super distinct. You can hear hoo -ah and hey, 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 hey. But that other thing might not be crystal clear. Here it is again. This is a little later in life. He, got, he actually got clearer. So he's saying, get over here. Get over here with a fisherman's accent. Okay? So again, Amazing, this distantly related mammal is using its vocal tract to produce these human-like, and it really sounds, for, for an American from this area, it sounds like a main fisherman. He's really matching the dialect of this particular language. Okay? So we do have other animals that can reproduce speech. This is not something that's uniquely human, and in fact, by current count, we have at least 10 different clades of animals, 10 different um, separate evolutionary groups of animals that have convergently evolved this characteristic. So three different groups of birds, both of the main groups of cetaceans, so toothed whales like dolphins and all the, and the large whales like humpback whales, some seals, both species of elephants, several species of bats, and then us uniquely among primates. So all of these different groups have, have independently evolved this capacity to hear sounds and then produce them. And of course, they don't normally use this to produce human speech. They normally use it to produce their own species typical sounds. And it's only in these unusual situations where they're raised with humans that they actually make uh, human sounds. So what this repeated convergent evolution gives us an opportunity to do is test this direction, the direct connections hypothesis. <coughs> Remember I said that these direct connections are hypothesized to be the reason we have so much control over our vocal tract. If that's true, then these other species that also have great <coughs> control over the vocal tract should also have direct connections, right? That's the prediction. And that prediction has been tested and upheld in all three of the different bird groups that have independently evolved the capacity to imitate sounds. So bird brain is quite different from mammals. I won't go into the details. If, you, if you're interested, I can explain them. But basically, the bird equivalent of motor cortex has direct predict projections down onto the bird vocal, the neurons that control the bird vocal organ, but only in those species of birds which are vocal imitators. So other birds like chickens or doves, which don't learn their songs, don't have these direct connections. Okay? So what this illustrates is this is a nice example of how convergent evolution can really be the biologist's best friend, because now we can actually go out and test hypotheses with independent data. Okay? So just to say a little bit more about why these direct connections matter, why should, why should it be so important to have these direct connections? There's been a lot of work done in many different mammals, but particularly in primates, on control of the hands. And this is a case where individual finger control is present in some monkey species or some mammal species and not present in others. So of course we have independent control over our fingers, that's why we can type and play piano or play clarinet or whatever. Um, so do chimpanzees. So chimpanzees can also do this and individually move one finger. So do some monkeys, like capuchin monkeys, but many monkeys or cats or opossums don't have that kind of control. And they basically use their hand as a, as a, as a whole thing. So a cat can't independently do this with its claws, and neither can, for example, a squirrel. So if we look at the, the neurons that actually control the fingers in the, in the spinal cord, what we find is that in those species like chimpanzees, well, humans, chimpanzees, and cebus monkeys have direct connections onto those individual motor neurons. And in those species where you don't have that kind of control, you don't have that, that same level of direct connections. So where direct connections are present, you get fast and independent control over the articulation. So the basic idea is that if you want to have good control over an instrument, you need to have these direct connections, and that's consistent with data from, from lots of other mammals. Okay, so just to wrap this up, um, 
First of all, I hope to have shown you why we can take a, how we can take a comparative biological approach and look at a wide range of species and tackle problems that are really important in understanding why our species can do can, can do speech and others can't. And then uh, the, the main conclusion is that these direct connections are crucial and it's not some aspect of the vocal anatomy that keeps chimpanzees or other monkeys from, from being able to talk, or other primates from being able to talk. Okay, so I'm going to now switch gears and talk about syntax, which will probably be closer to home turf. So, but before I do that, any questions about this? I'm going to leave all this speech and, and uh, acoustics behind. Yes. Um, I think most people have heard of apes like gorillas being able to do sign language. Yep. Do you have anything great to say about that? That will be like two slides down, so yes. Oh, I'll come back. <coughs> anything else? Okay. Um, yeah, so syntax. As I'm sure we're all aware, without this capacity to combine words into hierarchically structured structures into sentences or phrases, um, we wouldn't be able to use words that we can So I was just in Japan, yeah, and I speak, I have 20 words of Japanese, but I don't really know anything about Japanese syntax. That's enough to get me a beer, it's enough to find my way back to my hotel, but it sure isn't enough to talk about the past and the future or my dreams or make a plan about, you know, without syntax, you really can't um, express all of the things you can think. So for many people, and Chomsky is probably the foremost among them, the idea that is that syntax is really at the heart of this infinite use of finite means that makes language language. Okay? Um, I don't think syntax in this hierarchical sense is by any means limited to language because we have very good evidence for the same kinds of hierarchical structures being built up in music. And I would argue even in other domains like in visual arts, we, we have decent evidence for this. It's, probably strongest in music. So I, I, I want to suggest that we should think of syntax, at least initially, we should think of syntax as something that's potentially separate from language. It's a particular kind of capacity to build structures that can be applied to words in the case of language or notes and chords in the case of music. And so it's really this hierarchical tree building aspect of syntax that I want to focus on. And now to your question. So. If we look at sign uh, trained, tra trained apes, and this includes um, so Coco, who just had passed away, or Washo, who died a few years ago, Kanzi, who's probably one of the most famous, who um, both use gestures and this, this keyboard to communicate quite, quite a lot. I mean, basically, Kanzi is probably one of the top communicators that has ever existed outside of our, well, in not even primates. Um, and if we look at the, what they do with this system, so this is a system that in principle would allow Kanzi to talk about the future and the past and his dreams, you know, what did, he, what did he eat for breakfast yesterday? But if you look at what he actually does, he basically uses this system to make requests. He basically says things like, gimme, grape. Well, he actually does it the other way. He says, grape, gimme, or apple, gimme, or play, gimme. So that's, that's the way he basically uses this. He puts together two things into imperatives. He's, he's basically asking for stuff. Okay? And this has been analyzed recently um, by, uh, uh, by Yang and colleagues. And essentially, this is, this is syntax at the level of a two-year-old. So he does combine things. He does do it in a rule-governed way. But he doesn't build up more complex hierarchical structures. And none of these other language-trained apes have done so either. Okay? So even when you give other primates a means of communicating that doesn't rely on their vocal tract, they still don't do the same thing that any human child starts to do by the age of two and a half or three. They start putting together these hierarchical structures. And I probably don't need to tell you why this is so important, um, but I, just for biologists and psychologists, I often use this example of the importance of hierarchical structure. Um, the boy who kicked the dog chased the girl. And if I now ask you, who was it who chased the girl? You guys, if you're awake and you speak English, all know the answer and you think it's pretty obvious. But just imagine Kanzi, if you ask him the same question. So who, who chased the girl? Shout it out. The boy, right? But Kanzi could say, look, 
It says right here, the dog chased the girl, right? How can you, how can you argue that it's this, the boy, this thing that's much further away, when the sentence, the dog chased the girl, is built in? How can we argue that? Well, because we, as homo sapiens, see these, or get this hierarchical structure, this idea that who kicked the dog is essentially just a modifier. You might as well say the, you know, the big boy. Um, this whole thing might as well not be there. And we see the hierarchical relationship and not the linear relationship that dog chases the girl. Okay? And that's ultimately, without that, you wouldn't be able to make all these embeddings that make us able to talk about the past and the future and who knows what about who and all this other stuff. Right? So hierarchy is really critical for this, for, for building up complex structures. And it's easy to see how a non-human animal might not find this obvious. That, you know, the dog might seem like a perfectly good answer to Kanzi. In fact, we don't have good evidence that Kanzi does any kind of hierarchical embedding, even in, in his interpretation. But how can we get at this? What I want to do in my research, we work with a wide variety of animals. We want to have sort of general tests that can figure out what animals can do and what they can't do so that we can put our finger on it. And the structure that we've been using, which will be familiar to at least some of you, is uh, the formal language hierarchy. It's often called the Chomsky hierarchy because Chomsky made major contributions to it when he was a young guy. But really, this starts with the work of Alan Turing, this idea that we can essentially make a hierarchy that includes anything that's computed. So anything that you could write any computer program to write is within this hierarchy. That's this outermost, the Turing computable range. And then what Chomsky did was sort of create some intermediate zones, and the simplest one actually goes back even before Turing. These are the so-called finite state, state grammars, or regular grammars. These are basically just uh, stringing things together, so building up string-like sequences. So finite state grammars are very useful. They're, they're used a lot in, uh, for example, in modern computer programming. <coughs> but we know they're not enough to capture the full power of human language. For that, we need to go beyond this regular level of the regular grammars, the so-called super-regular level. And current uh, computational linguists think we're a little bit beyond this uh, context-free to into the context-sensitive grammars. So we don't have to worry about the details here. The crucial thing is that if you want to be able to build a hierarchy, you need to go beyond these sequential grammars that are, that are encompassed by a finite state or regular. Okay? So that's, a, that's nice because we know that anything that's computable is somewhere in here. And now the question that I've been trying to answer in the last 15 years or so is where do other non-human animals fall within this hierarchy? And we've done this with a lot of different ways, but I just want to illustrate this is one of the first things that we actually tried. Essentially what we do is, is build up artificial strings that represent different kinds of rule generating systems. Okay? So this one of them, the, the, this is a finite state grammar, is called AB to the N, which just means repeat AB as many times as you want. Okay? There's different A's and different B's, so we basically just get strings that look like AB, 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 AB. Okay? And, the, and that's at this lowest level, the innermost level of the Chomsky hierarchy. The other kind of structure, which we can mathematically show is beyond what a finite state grammar can do, is called a to the n, b to the n. And all this means is that the number of a's and the number of b's have to be the same. Okay? There's no particular matching among this a and this b or between the different individual things, but the number of those has to be the same. That seems like a very simple rule. And indeed, for humans in the lab, it's trivial. You guys would all get it. Um, but, it, as I'm going to show you, it turns out not to be so trivial for other animals. So for us, it just knocks you over the head. There's, the, the, there's this matching between the A's and the B's. Okay? And that requires that we go beyond this innermost level of the Chomsky hierarchy, beyond the finite state. Okay? So the first experiment I did with this, when, when I was still a postdoc at Harvard with Mark Hauser, we used this finite state grammar, and we were able to show that both humans and monkeys can get the grammar. What that means is that when I play to either species, when I play a bunch of sounds that follow the rules, and now I ask, okay, I'm going to play you a new sound, does that follow the same pattern as what you heard before or not? 
And in this case, we can just ask humans to push with the mouse button, same or different. If it's different, they say it's different. If it's the same, they say it's the same. No problem. For the monkeys, we can't ask them to do it with the mouse. Instead, we just play them the sounds and um, basically video record how often they look to the speaker. And the idea is that the more surprising it is, the more likely they are to look. And what we find is that when we play sounds that don't fit the pattern, they look more often. And when we play sounds that are like the pattern they heard before, they don't look very often. And that difference is significant. So what that means is the monkeys are discriminating between novel things, they've never heard this before, but one, in one case it's consistent, and in one case it's a violation. Okay? Are you with me with the logic here? This is classic artificial grammar learning. So now we do the exact same thing. We're using the same A's and B's, in fact, with a bunch of different monkeys. But now we build up this hierarchical rule. Three A's, three B's, or two A's, two B's, four A's, four B's. And humans, as I said, humans have no problem. Basically, for us, it's trivially easy to do. But for the monkeys, and we've done this now with many different, trying it different ways with musical notes versus human speech sounds versus animal sounds. And in none of the ways we've tried it can we get the monkeys to discriminate between violations and consistent numbers. Okay? So it looks like these um, hierarchical grammars are, are beyond the reach of this particular species. So in the meantime, we've tried other grammars. So here's just one kind of interesting one. A, B star A means there's got to be an A at the beginning and an A at the end, and as many Bs in between as you want. And that's a, a finite state grammar, that's a regular grammar, and that's something that we've tested in many different species. And in all the species we've tested, they can do that. So the squirrel monkeys, chimpanzees, and uh, marmosets. And we've done it in different ways. We've done it both visually and auditorily with these guys. We've done it with squirrel monkey calls and musical sounds with these guys. And we've done it with um, uh, musical, high, very high frequency musical sounds with those. And in all of these cases, the animals can do it. So it's not that they have a problem recognizing rules. We can come up with different kinds of rules, and they can learn those rules. So they do have a basic syntactic capacity. But it seems to be limited to this finite state, to this lowest level of the formal language. OK? So then we basically, one of the problems with the auditory experiments is you start worrying, OK, could it just be that by the time they get to the end of the sound, they've forgotten what they heard at the beginning? So could it be a problem with auditory memory? And so most of the experiments that we've been doing more recently use visual stimuli that are presented all at once. So these are the kinds of stimuli that we've been using in our lab now with many different species, including humans. We have humans who have looked at thousands of these. If any of you want to go online and do our experiment, you can look at these beautiful shapes. So what are these? Basically, these are the A's and these are the B's. But we build up the same exact structures that I told you about before, but now using these visual things instead of auditory. And crucially, any structure that we can build in, with, with, uh, in the auditory domain, we can match that with these visual things. But now, all of the stimuli are there at once. So the, the bird or the animal can look. You know, it doesn't have to remember this one by the time it gets around. Okay? So again, these are two examples of the same grammar. We've done a bunch of different grammars. But um, this AB to the N is the, the easy one, the finite state one. And this is the A to the N, B to the N. And this is even easier for humans, because you look at that. When, when humans look at this, they just automatically see this kind of symmetry between the, there's a bunch of A's and the same bunch of B's. Okay? It's really easy for us. You, you almost can't not see it. So we ask these two birds, two species. So we, we basically do the same thing. We show them a bunch of examples. And now we give them a choice between peck on the one that's consistent or the one that's inconsistent. And half the birds learn to peck on the inconsistent, half the birds learn to peck on consistent, just to make sure there's not a bias there. And, you know, the birds learn this pretty easily. They can do this, and they get, they get food for it. We've done two different species, namely pigeons, which are not renowned for their intelligence, but are renowned for pecking on the screen a lot, so they're good <laughs> subjects in the lab. And these guys, these are kias. They're one of the smartest birds we know about. These are very large brain New Zealand parrots. And in New Zealand, they're super famous for outsmarting people and figuring out how to get into the garbage and stripping cars of their, of their windshield wipers and all this stuff. So we, we weren't particularly optimistic about these guys, but we were highly optimistic that these Kias would be the smart birds that actually figure out our grammar. Okay, so same approach, same two grammars, and now, um, and the, the crucial thing, of course, is 
testing what they can generalize to. So we're going to show them new, new stimuli and ask, is this like the other ones? And we're interested in how far they can go away from the stimuli that they originally saw. So the, the first thing we do is just test with different arrangements of the same syllables. They, they have no problem doing that. Then we throw in some new syllables that they've never seen before. So that's a new B, and they do OK with that. We change the colors, no problem. We change the orientation from horizontal to vertical. They can do that without any problem. We remove the color. That's harder, but they can also do that. Now we come to the crucial ones, though, where we extend the length. So now this is going beyond the length that they saw before. If they went up to a, uh, three A's and three B's, we now go to four A's and four B's, or five A's and five B's, OK? They get that, too, in both grammars. So now the really crucial thing for this a to the n, b to the n grammar is what happens if you see two a's and three b's? If you know the rule, that's a violation, right? So we play these mismatch grammars to our, or we show these mismatch grammars to our birds, three a's, four b's, four a's, three b's, and they fail. And even when we train them, so we give them intensive training for several weeks where they have one that matches and one that doesn't match, and we, and we force them to peck, to peck the right one, and they want that peanut. They really work at this. They still can't learn it. So really surprising result, really disappointing result. Here's the data. It's just showing you what I told you. Um, the extensions are, the, the pigeons actually don't generalize very well. But the P is generalized to these extensions. But when it comes to these mismatch foils, they fail entirely. Okay, they're a chance. So that was disappointing. That was a, a year's work of uh, two postdocs, and they weren't able to do it. But it did enable us, because we had all this data, to ask, what is it that they are doing? What are these birds doing? They're getting 100% correct on the training trials. So they've learned something. And we can now ask, what is it exactly they learned? We use an approach. I won't go into the details. It's called maximum likelihood. Essentially, what we do is ask, what are all the possible hypotheses that the bird could be doing? And then for each individual bird, we ask for each one of its data, for each one of its answers, is it consist how consistent is it with each of these hypotheses? And that allows us for each bird to build up a model of what it's actually thinking when it makes its choices. Right? So here's what we find. Let's start with the pigeons. If we look at the pigeons, we see that each, these are individual pigeons, each bird has a sort of idiosyncratic mixture of different hypotheses. It looks like they're actually changing hypotheses as they go. But they never really make this. This guy at least had a pretty clear idea of what he was doing. And most of them never really make up their mind, and they don't do very well. The Kias, on the other hand, are remarkably consistent. They have a very simple trick that works perfectly, and it's a finite state or regular trick. It's a trick at the simplest level of the Chomsky hierarchy. Namely, if you're doing A to the N, B to the N, look for two A's at the beginning. That's what one bird did. And the other bird just look for two B's at the end. Okay? So that's actually really smart. That's a really clever answer. Why don't humans think of that? Why don't we look at these things and just pay attention to the first two A's or the last two B's? In a way, the birds are, they're, they're, they've found a more clever answer than us in the sense that it's an easier answer to compute. It requires less, kind of, it's le a less challenging thing to compute. Okay? So, again, the point here is that it's not that birds don't have syntax, so they can't learn these different rules. They don't do it the same way we do. And that's the ultimate, uh, my ultimate conclusion from this. So what we have now, to summarize this and a lot of other work, is lots of evidence of animals in both the auditory and the visual domain coming, being able to solve grammars at this simplest level. But the only species, until very recently, that we had evidence could go beyond that was our Homo sapiens. Okay? And that was the case, the last review article I read about this a couple years ago. That's what I concluded. And now, just last year, um, a new paper came out from um, the one lab in Paris. And this is work that Stan Dahan was behind. Um, what they did is they trained a monkey on a touch screen, so similar to what we did before. But now they're using basically patterns of uh, these visual patterns that go back and forth. And the monkey has to push these buttons. So it's more like a, a spatial motor 
task that they have to learn how to do. But you can also build things like mirror grammars and A to the N, B to the N, et cetera, et cetera, with this pattern. And it takes a long time, it's a lot of work, but two of the monkeys actually were successful in learning the mirror grammar, which is another example of a super regular grammar, something you can't do with the simplest level. So we see here time in 100, so we see that it takes a while, but the monkey finally gets up to basically 100% on this mirror grammar. And this guy never does quite as well. This was a really smart monkey. So you might wonder, what is this unit of time? Is this 100 trials or 100 seconds or what? Now that's 100 blocks, which means 100 days. So this took more than a year of training for these monkeys to get this. Okay? So they can do it, but it's really hard. It takes this very intensive training, and not all monkeys do it very well. So what I really liked about this paper was that they did this with the monkeys, and then they used the exact same task, and they went into a school, and they did this with, uh, with preschoolers, so four-year-olds. And the kids were able to do exactly the same grammars after five demonstrations. So five trials, the kids get it. Kids get it. Okay? So what this leads me to conclude is that humans are special in this particular way. We have a strong inclination to see the bigger pattern in a set of data, when for all of these different animals we've looked at, the strong inclination is to just look at a part of that. Look at, look at a string at the beginning or at the end or maybe in the middle, but not pay attention to the whole arrangement of data in the structure. Okay? So that leads me to what I've been calling the dendrophilia hypothesis. So dendro is tree, philia is love. The idea is that humans have a love of trees, that we're basically born to look for tree structures wherever we can, to analyze the data from, the, from our senses in terms of tree structures. And I think this is typical of our species. I think it's multi-domain because, as I told you at the beginning, we have good evidence that we do this in music and also, for example, with these visual tiles. So it's, it's not just an ability to do this. It's a propensity. We, we do it without anybody asking us to. We do it without training. Okay? And that requires, that hierarchical structure requires computations at the super regular level. It goes beyond the simplest level of the Chomsky hierarchy. And what these macaque data show us is that, yeah, monkeys can do it. They've got the ability, but it doesn't come naturally to them at all. It's something that's really, really hard. We really have to train them. And this kind of training would never happen in the wild. No monkey would ever get this kind of intensive experience in nature. Okay, so that's the dendrophilia hypothesis. And what I want to end with, and I guess I'm, I'm a little behind time, but this is the part where I'm not sure how interested you guys are going to be. What I want to end with is saying something about where, what we think is going on in the brain when we do these dendrophilic hierarchical computations. But maybe I should stop here and see if there's any questions about the stuff that came before and uh, before I launch into the neuroscience. Questions? Yeah? Well, you mentioned that monkeys would never get this in the wild, but how do you think that happened for us? Ha. That's the million dollar question. Yeah, what exactly drove this dendrophilia in our species. I mean, what we have are a lot of hypotheses, and the three that I think are most plausible is are that it has something to do with tools, and basically manufacturing tools, because we know for the last three million years, humans have been getting more and more complex tool building. We've developed these toolkits. Um, so it may have something to do with the planning for building up complex tools, and then that sort of spread. Once you have the neural circuits for that, you could do it for other things. It's one possibility. Another, and I think this is better based in the primate data, is social, social knowledge. And essentially, even if we look in, say, baboons, but certainly in chimpanzees, playing the, the social world plays a crucial role in their survival. It really plays a role in fitness, and being able to outsmart others um, is, is really important. So to the extent that you can have an independent idea in your mind of what another animal thinks, so a theory of mind, or know that uh, this animal knows something that animal doesn't know, once you can start doing that, you could get an arms race that basically builds up more and more complex um, semantic structures, and that that could be the, the factor that, that uh, sort of drove this dendrophilia. 
And then Chomsky's, I mean, this is, it was my idea, but Chomsky really likes it, is that it actually had to do with navigation. And it's basically spatial knowledge and finding your way. So if you think about, if I ask you where your toothbrush is, probably all of you have a pretty good sense. And if I asked you to tell me where it is, you'd have to tell me, well, uh, it's in Ghent, and it's in this sector, and on this street, in this building, in this apartment, in this room, in this drawer of this cabinet, right? So that's a very hierarchically structured way of thinking about space. And that's another, that's a third place. So all of these are what are called exaptive hypotheses in the sense that there's a, there, there would be some cognitive ability there that got fed by, that, that took on more and more meaning in our evolutionary history, and so it got pushed to the sort of catch point where it essentially spread and became available for other domains. So those are the three hypotheses that are out there right now. Yeah. And could it be that maybe dogs can do it as well? Because they're really social and hunting them? Well, that, the problem with any of these hypotheses is that since we don't have good evidence of another species doing this dendrophilia, so I wouldn't call what the monkeys are doing dendrophilia. It's sort of, dendro, they're dendrocompetent to a very meager degree, but it's not like they really want to do this. So what we would need um, to, to really test the hypothesis is a species that's really good at that. So another way you could turn it around is ask, okay, what if we look at the most complex social, the organisms that show the most complex sort of Machiavellian intelligence, that's where we would see, we, we might expect the best the best evidence of this. So that's, a, that's one way of testing it. That's it. Well, I thought we were going to get a conversation about evolution there, which might be more fun than <laughs> our sense. All right, well, I'll wrap up kind of quickly, and you guys can ask me if you, if you, if you want more details, I can give you some more details. But essentially, what, what I've argued in several recent papers, and what I want to show you right now, is the idea that essentially what gave us this capacity to build up hierarchical structures is an enlargement in a particular area of the brain called Broca's area, which probably most of you have heard of, the, the part of the inferior frontal gyrus here and the back part of the frontal lobes on both sides, um, that this basically increased in size and it increased its connectivity to the rest of the brain, which gave us this kind of general purpose hierarchical structure building um, capacity. And this is based on the idea that in, in formal language theory, all of that Chomsky hierarchy stuff that I told you about has a counterpart in the, the computer mechanisms that are needed to build these different kinds of structures of, or of rules. And this would be the sort of simplest type of computer that can calculate sequences. It's called a finite state automaton. And if you want to go beyond that to build hierarchical structures, what you need is to, to add a stack. It's called a stack, which basically means an auxiliary memory source that can store away intermediate values. Okay? And that's just kind of computer science theory. This is what, I, as I mentioned, Chomsky did very early on in his career, back in the late 50s, was come up with this whole um, this push down automaton, context-free grammars. Um, the basic idea is if you take one of these, a normal, which we presume all of these different animals have, the computing machinery to build up sequences, and add a stack, then you can build up sequences. Add a stack or add several stacks. Okay, so what I want to argue is that the role of this stack is being played by Broca's area in our brains. So what's the evidence for this? Well, the, probably the biggest evidence comes from brain imaging studies where many different experiments show that if you, as you increase the hierarchical complexity of input, whether in music or in language, we see more and more activation of Broca's area. So this is one of many experiments that shows this. And again, I don't really need to go into the detail, but these areas here are Broca's areas. And what we see is that the, as we increase the hierarchical complexity of those, these areas get more and more excited. And there's a control there to make sure that it's not just semantic complexity, which is to use Jabberwocky speech, so basically nonsense words. And it works the same way. Okay? So this part of the brain gets more and more activated the more hierarchical structure you build. Okay? So that's point one. Point two comes from anatomy. If we compare that part of the brain between us and chimpanzees, we find that Broca's area is the most enlarged area of our brain that we know about. So chimpanzees do have a Broca's area, but it's very small. It's about six times smaller in, uh, six to seven times smaller in a chimpanzee than it is in a human. Or we should really say it's seven times bigger in us than a chimpanzee because they're, they're probably relatively normal. Okay? 
Okay? You might think, well, maybe that's just because chimpanzees have bigger brains. No, because other parts of the brain, for example, visual cortex, V1, that's where the input from the eyes comes in, that's only twice as big in a human compared to a chimpanzee. Okay? So this is not only activated in these fMRI experiments in humans, it's much bigger. And I think the final clincher is that it's also much more heavily connected to the rest of the brain. <coughs> so if you look at a monkey, again, they have this little Broca's area, but it's barely connected to even the frontal, the, the top half of the brain, and it basically doesn't make strong connections back here in the parietal on the temporal lobe. Chimpanzees have got a little bit more, but essentially this area of the brain is attached to everything else in, in humans. So not only has the amount of cortical real estate increased, but its connectivity to the rest of the brain, to all of the other things that the brain is computing or thinking of, or all the different sensory inputs, has also drastically increased. And there's independent evidence. Basically, this shows in a macaque human comparison those parts of the brain that are most outstandingly connected in humans relative to macaques are all these areas that are connected to Burke's area. Okay? So what I'm, the argument now is that essentially this role of the stack is played by this enlarged and more heavily interconnected part of our brain. And that gives us this domain general, or at least it's domain, it's in two domains, music and language, this capacity to build up hierarchical structures. And that makes sense from a computational point of view. It also checks out with the neural data. Okay? And again, if you want to get into more detail about that, we can go back through these slides and I can walk you through them a little more uh, slowly. Anyway, just to summarize, the, the basic idea is that this Broca's area gives us a kind of <coughs> extra memory store that enables us, for example, if we're doing this A to the N, B to the N grammar, to say, okay, there were three A's, store away three, and now there's three B's, ah, check, okay? So three, three, that checks out. If you don't have that intermediate memory, you can't do that. So you need a kind of auxiliary working memory um, yeah, well, anyway. And so you basically need to expand the number of neurons in order to do that and also expand how they're connected. All right, and just to wrap up, what I hope to have shown you in this lecture is why, first of all, if we want to understand something as complex as human language, we should be breaking up it in, in, into its component parts and then asking which of those parts are shared with other species. And we shouldn't just assume, oh, language is unique, so we can't study it in animals. Rather, once we take any particular part of it, say the capacity for vocal orientation or the capacity for simple syntax, we can find that in other animals. Um, I argued in the first part of the talk that the key determinants of speech are neural, and it's not the vocal anatomy, it's about these direct connections, at least that's one of the things that's important. And I think our picture of what's special about human syntax is getting more and more clear as we do these kinds of experiments. And that's led me to argue for this dendrophilia hypothesis, that essentially humans go through the world looking for trees wherever we can. Um, and the argument, and this is consistent, but I wouldn't say this is a very strong argument yet, is that that hierarchical computation is subserved by this part of our brain that's massively expanded uh, since we diverged from chimpanzees. Okay? So lots of people helped me with this work. I mentioned some of them as we went along, um, but I think I'll just cut to the chase and say thank you very much. So, but, but the crucial thing that we know about frontal cortex, I think I have a slide to show this. There's been a lot of work in lots of different animals about how frontal cortex does its job. So basically, frontal cortex plays an important role in things like attention, executive control, switching between different courses of action. And the way it does that is that through these neuronal assemblies in different parts of the brain, essentially a neuron here can become part of a, of, a, of a cycle, basically these phase lock neurons that are firing together. So they form a sort of temporary circuit, a functional circuit, which um, can pick out different things in the brain and suppress others. 
Okay? And that's the general thing. That's the way frontal cortex works in a monkey or in a cat. Um, and, but what seems to be special about us is how super connected this particular frontal area is. So what I would say is that if, if we could do single unit recording from large swaths of the human brain, what we would find then is that for, for example, for a particular sentence, you have to activate particular lexical items in the temporal cortex. You probably have to combine those um, using activity in the frontal cortex to build up the hierarchical structure that allows you to make sense, not just of the meanings and the sounds of those words, but how they fit together in a particular sentence. Something like that is what we posit is going on. Would you some kind of Yeah, well now, I mean, yes, in the sense, there, there's a trivial sense in which that must be true. So, you know, the, 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 the neurons are nonlinear systems, they're coupled nonlinear systems. So what we're always talking about, once we start talking about multiple neurons firing together, is an attractor. What kind of attractor is a really interesting question. So that's, and I, I think that's reaching the limit of, of what we know of, of computational neuroscience right now. A lot of people want to argue that the brain is on the edge of chaos. You probably, by the, since you asked about attractors, you probably know what chaos is. That essentially the, the, the brain is a system that's always sitting on the edge of chaos. And basically but the, the, all the control that we have is by moving back and forth in that, between that order. But we don't really know that. I mean, there's also just straight limit cycles. So normal, normal limit cycles are plenty of, they're, they're abundant in the brain. So, but you've, you've, you've come right to the point where nobody can really answer the question. Certainly not me, and I don't think anybody else in computational neuroscience can really give you the answer that we would like. That's really the million dollar question that everybody, how exactly does working memory and attention and executive control, how is that cashed out in neural firing? That's, that's the big question. We know a lot of we know a lot of sort of background material. I could talk for hours about NMDA receptors, but the real answer to that question at the level that a computer scientists would want it is still not available. But maybe it will be. Ten years? Give us time. <clears throat> Sorry, that was probably Mumbo Jumbo to half of you. But. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, a lot of what you said was about um, whether animals are able to reproduce. Um, things we say or produce language, um, but what about uh, being able to understand and comprehend? Um, I think there's a lot of species who have shown that they can uh, understand what other people or what people are trying to tell them. Yep. Yeah, so I mean, the, these cases, I didn't talk a lot about this, but Kanzi is a good example. What he does with this keyboard is very simple. I mean, he really doesn't do anything very complicated. But you can say with speech, Kanzi, um, you know, whatever. Kanzi put the hat on the refrigerator, and he can get, he can do it. So his understanding is much greater than his output. So I mean, I think that's that's crucial. But all of these experiments that I told you about, these experiments here, those are about their comprehension. So there is there is plenty of work done asking, for example, in bird song or whale song, what is the complexity of the structures that they build up in song. That's more like, what can they do? What, what do they do? But it's perfectly possible that they might have relatively simple productions, but still be able to understand, still be able to, to perceive more complex structures. So that's why we do these kinds of experiments like this, is to probe their perceptual abilities at the syntactic level. Right? But you're right. I mean, basically, I would argue that the understanding of any creature is going to be much greater than their ability to produce. I mean, that's even true with humans. We have, our receptive vocabulary is bigger than, than what we normally say, and kids typically have a much larger receptive vocabulary than, than their productive vocabulary. And I think that's probably true across the board. So your dog can understand when you say walkies or treat or his name, even though he can't say his name. Or if your dog came up and said walkies, <laughs> then you'd have something to put on YouTube. <laughs> Other questions? I just maybe want to throw in that if you're interested, about two and a half years ago, we had Rob Treswell here from Edinburgh, who's a syntactician and who has analyzed the Kanzi data and has uh, basically argued that uh, Kanzi is not a dentrophile at all. So he, that this whole was called that uh, says, was children in fear of trees. Yeah, he, said, he calls <laughs> and he says, a video that we've Kanzi is a dendrophobe. Yes. Dendrophobia. 
He's like actively avoiding trees. Is there a correlation between um, the uh, complexity of syntax that animals can handle and um, the uh, size of their social groups? Mm -hmm. To be honest, we don't have enough data to really answer that question. So if you look at, um, for example, these kias, which are doing a lot of things that other birds don't do, they do live in, it's not as much the size as the complexity. So, you know, pigeons fly in big flocks, but we don't have good evidence that, for example, they know a lot of, them. they know their mates, they know their kids, but the rest of them are just a bunch of pigeons. These kias, or ravens, are another really smart uh, bird. They know individuals, and they know complex social relationships, and they know, for example, who's friends with whom, and so I can attack you when your friends aren't around, but I can't attack you when your friends are there. That's the kind of complex social knowledge. And that does correlate with sort of general intelligence in other domains, but as far as running all these different species with this particular kind of experiment, with these grammatical experiments, we don't have that. But in general, yeah, the idea that social complexity goes along with general intellectual abilities is one of the leading, it's called the social intelligence hypothesis. It's one of the leading hypotheses for why animals are smart. Or why some animals are smarter than others. I should say. Yep. Do you have any data on crows? Because I hear they are very smart as well. Yeah, I, that would have been the other talk. <laughs> Let's see if I have any of this stuff in here. No, I don't have the, the slide. Oh, wait, well, yeah, we've done a lot. My, my lab does a lot of work on crows. Well, crows and ravens. Ravens are, I think, the most interesting. So ravens are the largest brain birds. They're the largest songbirds and the largest brain birds. And we have both a field site where we study them in the field and a lab. So we work on them with touchscreens and stuff in the lab, just not doing these particular kinds of experiments. And yeah, these are, those are really among the smartest birds that we know about, both in terms of things like tool use. So New Caledonian crows are the most sophisticated tool users outside of humans and chimpanzees. And I think they give chimpanzees a run for the money. But also in terms of this kind of social intelligence, things like hiding food and then re-hiding it when the person who saw you hiding it is not there, and stealing food from others where others have hidden it, and all this kind of stuff. So there's a very rich world, and you know, if you Google Corvid intelligence, you'll find a bunch of papers on this on that topic. Yeah, it's fine. Yes, in the back. Birds communicating with dogs? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it does actually. My brother's dog was named Spock, and my cousin had a gray parrot. So gray parrots are one of the great imitators. And this parrot would really toy with the dog and say, hey, Spock, hey, Spock. So he knew, A, the, the words, but also knew that it was associated with this dog. And the dog never quite figured out that it was the bird talking to <laughs> So I, I think it was less the bird communicating with the dog and more the bird playing with the dog. But we have lots of evidence, for example, that um, birds and primates learn each other's alarm calls, so that monkeys will respond to the alarms of birds in the environment and vice versa. So there's plenty of evidence of cross-species communication. I mean, it doesn't reach the level of language, obviously, but it, it certainly does happen. Wow. Okay. Usually the, the questions just are never ending, so I guess uh, Maybe my, my tiredness from being on Tokyo time is contagious. <laughs> I think everybody had a long day uh, behind them, right? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.